Hey folks, Storytelling Ron here. I want to talk about Princes of the Apocalypse. Princes, Princes of the Apocalypse. So I, I love D&D, right? Um, I, 5e is awesome, and Wizard of the Coast, and what they're doing, what the products they're putting out is great, okay? I want to talk about, ugh, my chair. I want to talk about, talk about, talk about Princes of the Apocalypse. Um, I've got all the um, adventure books. I love them. I enjoy reading them. You know, in this one, so I'm reading it and I'm like, man, it's kind of grindy, kind of kind of dungeon grindy, you know? And um, so I kind of looked around on YouTube and I love YouTube. I love the people that con contribute on YouTube. So I'm, uh, I want to just kind of do a video. Anyway, so I, I was, I saw a bunch of YouTube videos and podcasts and man, my suspicions were confirmed. You know, the Princess of the Apocalypse has got problems and I love, you know, I, at first, I didn't like it. I'm like, ugh. But you know what? I, can, I, you can love it. You can. Now on YouTube, I saw like one guy was doing a review, and then he said that halfway through their campaign, the players asked if they could stop playing Princes of the Apocalypse. That's a bummer. Okay. Um, another group, the guy, the players asked. You know, they they were doing a um, post post whatever op whatever thing, and I'm bad with naming conventions, so just bear with me. I'm get nomenclatures off anyway so they did a post op on podcast and the guys they asked the dm so what was your favorite part you know and he said oh the the water veil thing you know that part and, and, he, and of course oh that's not part of the actual story that's a side adventure and then he goes but you guys never went there that was his favorite part and the players were like well we had no motivation to go there we didn't have any motivation to go anywhere actually okay so they're you know what? Rizzo's of the Coast, look, they do great stuff and more is better. So they, I do feel that when they make their adventure books, they try to just throw all bunch of, a bunch of stuff at you, which is, which is good. And I appreciate that. But at some point, you know, you gotta like, not, not them because more is better. So that's great. But as a DM, you gotta write, you gotta edit every, every great artist needs editors. Okay. And, and we DMs technically when we, if we t do these as opposed to homebrews, we need to edit it down to what we want to do. So I, I'm giving you what I would do, okay, to, to make this better. And I haven't played this one yet. I'm doing Tomb of Annihilation, which I love. Um, and, you know, I'm obviously editing that to what I want, which is what, what you're supposed to do anyway. But I want to give you suggestions on how to, to make Princess of the Apocalypse work. And I'm assuming that most of you DMs like me had sitting up there collecting dust like all the others. I've decided I'm, I'm going to go through these and help you streamline it down to something, um, you know, maybe you could play within a year. Of, of of games not just you know not too much longer and anyway so i'm going to go through what i've done and what i plan on doing and if you're someone that i'm going to be playing please do not watch this this is not for players this is just for dms and this is also to help maybe new dms sort of get a grasp of princess of the apocalypse or how you can take an overwhelming book of 300 pages or whatever how many pages they are um and make it manageable so princess of the apocalypse um, let's just start going through it. Okay. You need a, a, a backstory that really, well, one is simple and works to streamline the adventure. So here's what I have put together. Rise of cults. Okay. Obviously I'm going to keep, keep as much as I can from the original, but simple, but you know, streamline it, cut out the fat. There's the four prophets, uh, have established these temples. They got those legendary, legendary weapons from the elemental evil eye, you know, and that, and the weapons were made by a drow smith long ago. They're invulnerable. And these are important part, points for me as well as the GM. Invulnerable. The weapons must be used to open a gateway to summon the respective evil on the elemental prince. If the weapons were to be thrown into gates without any, with any blemishes or cracks, it would destroy the gates. So that's the goal. That's the end goal. Only way to do that is with a hammer used by the drow smith, which is in the faint of the eye. So that means that they have to go to the faint of the eye to get that hammer. And all of this is going to be, bro you know, broken out into tiny bits amongst the locations they go to and the villains they kill and the people they free to learn this information. Plus maybe, you know, a great wizard or, or whatever NPC that might reveal some other truths too to help them with this backstory. Now, the goal here, I don't like that they, with this one, and then with, like, some of the Giants, where they make you pick um, a location to go to, they're going to want to go to every location. That's the way this should be played out. 
every in, in my view they they want not only will go to every location they have to and they want to we gotta go we gotta go do this we gotta stop them we gotta stop them you know everyone that's the way i would want them to play elemental um any of these adventure books because i want to stick with the theme and the theme is fun now i appreciate that they add a bunch of different other adventures and all that in, in these things and then so you literally get like 20 different modules plus this adventure book campaign book or whatever you know what i mean um so th so i don't they can keep doing what they're doing but i as a dm would this is what i would suggest you do okay now here here's the here's where you're going to get them all stuck on saving the world um each of the elemental uh cults will must sacrifice so also in order to draw the gate to this world or in the prince they must sacrifice souls according to their element, which are done at the outposts, temples, and with the orbs. See? So I'm combining them all. Um, so the air, they have to fling them through the air to die. You know, they're gasping for uh, air in, in, in a shocking way. Whatever, you know. Gra maybe it's a gravity gap. I don't know. Whatever. But you know what I'm saying? So in the water, they're drowning. And in the fire, they're burning. and the earth, they're burying them alive. Horrible stuff. See? So right there, the players are going to want to start saving you know, in killing these evil cultists. Remember, it's evil. Okay. Cult tasks. So sacrifice souls. The other thing they got to do is gather treasure. I'll just go through this quickly. And the, when they gather the treasure, uh, that's what helps them to make the devastation orbs, which will then kill more people and get more souls. See, so they're so they got to stop them in all these different levels. And it's not just about retaliating against the players. It's about killing people. And so that's going to make the players, oh my God, oh my gosh, we got to save this village or this farmstead or you know, from, from all the, the, these killings. Now, what's a cool thing is that if, if um, as the story progresses and they're trying to kill more souls and if players obviously thwart them, uh, the villains are going to be at the, the prophets, the, the main, you know, villains, are going to be at a point where they may hopefully get to a point where they have to sacrifice or they have to just go ahead and open the gate because they're running out of time. The players are chasing them or whatever. And then, you know, they have to, they, they summon the prince, but the prince isn't satisfied, so it kills the prophet maybe in front of them, you know, and either leaves or or fights fights the players a little bit but maybe doesn't care to stay or whatever you know you know you can figure you can figure that out but anyway so why the storyline like i said oh take out the caravan where they got to rescue and find different people and you know that gets confusing and who what take all that out you don't need any of that um da, 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 yeah you have to about all that going to different you and then you know you can probably use divination at some point to help them to get more info but they already said that so encounter progression early on okay so you can do this at first level as soon as they make their characters that's obviously the first point of uh, uh that's the best you know you know it's not the best part but it's obviously an incredibly fun part is to make first level characters that you start for this campaign knowing you're going to go through this campaign and that is like the part of the joy of of of, uh, of these campaign books um and, and or doing like a campaign and i'm i'm primarily a homebrew person myself but i've decided to try doing these just for the fun of it and i'm kind of getting into them and you know i'm doing tomb of annihilation which i'm enjoying but again i do a lot of homebrew whatever so start at first level and i'll give you some examples of where and how and all that you can get this them right on the story boom start on the story okay the fear of the cults there's people missing Everyone's afraid. The farmers are not traveling anymore. The merchants are scared and get esc and need escorts. You know, they, these are all first level things that you can you can do. Um, there's there's a uh, one of the villages is primarily hobbits and and so they could be afraid of big the big vultures from the air cult. Uh, the big vultures are coming in and carrying them off. You know what I mean? That's the first level. The giant vultures are pretty pretty first pretty good for first level. Along with the uh, their cult riders, the Howling Hatred Initiates, the Initiates could be riding them and hiding on them, um, you know, and pretending that it's just giant vultures, and that's what the hall, the halflings all think. Um, but then, you know, the players can discover, hey, these are you know being ridden and controlled and part of the air cult. So there's that. Uh, also, the Crushing Wave Reavers are pretty low level, and they're kind of like bandits, and and they could be along the river. You know, abducting people and drowning them or taking them back to the outpost to do a sacrificial um, thing. So that's another nice little, you know, first to third level um, buildup of the characters. Now, the um, and so there you got a whole bunch of little just fun little things you could do. And, and I'm, you know, that use a DM can help cr uh, create those little encounters. Now, um, also, they'll probably want to meet you want them to meet the Feathergale Knights, which are obviously the air cult evil things. And um, did I say spoiler alert? whatever so the vultures um 
And then, of course, the vultures are seen in the Sighing Valley in that area. I'll show you that on the map here in a sec. So these, these Feathergale Knights can be kind of suspicious characters for a little bit. So you kind of, and I'll tell you more about uh, developing these stories, but I just want to give you a quick rundown of the location, location progression, okay, outposts. Obviously, those are, those are the first four outposts, and they correspond to the different cults, the Feathergale Spire and the Sighing Valley, which I think is pretty cool. The Sighing Valley is kind of cool. It's got a lot of low-level low adventure, low, low adventures there. Um, the River Guard Keep and Boat Attack, I think, are pretty cool, low to mid-level, um, especially if they want to take the keep and do some, you know, deal with little pirates on the river. That's kind of cool. That's, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Sacred Stone Monastery is going to be more of a dungeony crawl kind of thing, a little higher, a little mid-level. In a mid-level, I mean fourth. Um, and Scarlet Moon Hall is going to be fun, fourth to fifth kind of thing. Um, then you're going to have you you as a DM going to decide the pace of it with some cult retaliations with the devastation orbs, and they don't necessarily have to go against the players, but just against the you know there's, they got a, maybe one maybe somebody finally got a devastation orb and they're going to use it on a village, and that'll start you know anting up the uh, oh we got to get going we got to stop stop these. And I personally, as a DM, I would recommend um, trying to encourage the little players to move what they want. Encourage them to go from air to water to stone and fire, like in that order. That's kind of what I would do. Um, obviously, the devastation orbs, you know, for the air would be a tornadoes. The water would be flooding. The quakes for the earth and fires for the, um, other, the fire. So also, the, and then, of course, the progression, once they discover what's going on here. And remember, the backstory, you break it down. Oh, no. I know you can't see me pointing with this because they break down uh, the backstory. You want to break it up into all these little areas so that they learn a little bit each time. And obviously cross-reference them. Like if one one says, oh, there's leader prophets who have weapons that are leading us. And in the second one, there's these leaders who are leading us with weapons and then some other stuff, you know, like kind of repeat stuff in there as well, mix it up a little bit so that it reconfirms what they learned in the first one. And they're, oh, you know, something, you know what I mean? Or you could say in the first one, all the elemental leaders have weapons. And in the second one, our leader has a weapon, you know, so that so there's like, oh, there's a cross-referencing realization by the players. OK. Anyway, uh, then the temples, obviously, they're going to go through the temples and I would. I would in the in the in the um, when they learn, they're going to learn maybe what's in those temples so that they know, shoot, they got a bunch of trolls in this one. We better not fight them until we're ready. You know what I mean? Let's go do this instead. I would go ahead and give them a little intel once in a while to warn them of what's what what's you know, what they're going to encounter. So instead of because like, oh, the temple's just down here. We can go from, the, you know, from the outpost to the temple. But the but the slave guy said they they saw a bunch of trolls, you know. So maybe we shouldn't go there yet. You know what I mean? So you, you want to do that kind of stuff. Um, so the temples, obviously, then the faint of the eye, then the finales, the geodes, where the where the gates are, and in that kind of order, you want to do it. And, you know, you're going to mix it up, and there's going to be. I'm assuming there's going to be a chase thing. And a, so, so you've got four prophets, right? And each of them are trying to summon uh, a prince of own and evil. You, what, as a DM, you want to try to get one prophet that they actually deal with and get the weapon and stop them completely, which I'm assuming will be the air one because she's a she's a very egotistical and won't won't retreat. Then you can have one that really kind of gets away and gets to the faint of the eye, and then they have a fight there with that one with 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 his team of defenders. Uh, that would be cool. And then maybe you get one that actually gets to the gate and screws it up, whether he summons it too soon or um, they stop him and then they get the weapon and. And then they blemish it, you know, crack it or whatever, and then throw it in the gate to destroy it. But then have the prince come out anyway, but just for like a round or two and get, let him get a taste, you know. And then the fi final one obviously gets out. Like the, the guy gets it and does it. And it would be cool, like, if he was maybe in the geode or even like on the land. I would, or you could even have where, you know, whatever progression, you could have where they really fight one in the lair if you think they're having fun and tough. And then I would have one... Um, or if you think, or if you think the elemental prince is too tough, have it roam the land, start killing people, or you know doing its thing. But then they get help. They get help from like dwar a dwarven team or the knights. You know, there's the summit hall has knights, so you get help from them or what. You know what I mean? Some NPCs coming. You know, so it's a big battle kind of thing. That may be kind of cool. Okay, so I kind of explained the sequence, like what I just said. Um, but the Feathergale knights will be flamboyant. You know, they got their flying mounds. I I think they they should be sort of mischievous they pretend they are watching out for the vultures but actually are with them 
And you can obviously use what's in the module, the way they kind of play it there and describe the characters, which is fine, or you know, however you want to do that. I do have my own thing, which I'm going to go through because, oh, I do have a, an explanation of all the locations. I'm going to make this a long video just because I enjoy watching D&D videos. I, I did, um, I do have an explanation of each of these locations of, my, of how I would do it. Um, just to streamline it a bit because they're very, you can, you know, room to room dungeon grind. And so I would, I'll explain to you what I would do. Okay. Then the river guard. Uh, okay. I did I'll explain all that. Okay. Hey, so, you know, you get the dwarves and I think, I don't know about no, the dwarves of the lost kingdom or whatever, because they can inform the players of the underground runes. So they might encounter some dwarves in the village or on the road or something. Um, you know, and these could be really guarded doors with their escorted wagons to try and deliver something or whatever and be suspicious. But then they kind of give them some info if, if they, if the characters play it out right. You know, so you always want to give them opportunities to learn stuff as long as they play it out right. If they don't play it out right and you think they're rude or jerks, then the doors keep going or whatever NPC it is. Um, you know, learn about the hatred of each cult for each other, which you can play that off if you want. Role play that. Um, you know, learn that each one has a special weapon and then, you know, they, they, they it, it opens the gate, but if it's ever blemished, you know, it'll destroy the gate. So there's their clue. And you got to definitely give that somewhere later along the line um you want to break it up how you ever you want and you always you know when i when i dm i always sort of have the backstory in my notes and then i kind of mark what what what, what they what has already been revealed so that i know what next to reveal at a perfect time you know in the story when they're doing something saving someone talk npc with someone or role playing with npcs um or defeating someone and they say something you know I always sort of have that ready, the next little, you know, and I kind of the gray area of like previous stuff is repeated and, and then the new stuff. Okay. So some good help as well. The Eric, 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 the, the flying bird dudes. So I think, you know, if they're in trouble, especially early on, they, these guys could come and help them out, you know, just once, well, you know, whatever, um, maybe even in the finale. Uh, the giant and a giant eagle would be cool. Maybe in the finale, the doors obviously, and the patrol of good knights and clerics could could come along. And I always, I do like to make, especially human NPCs, I like to make them very snobby in the beginning, very rude, very don't care who these you know low level characters are or whatever they are, or suspicious of high level characters, so that when the characters prove themselves or do something, then you know there's a you know the knights come around, and you you saved us, and we you know we. You know, we appreciate what you've done and you've been brave and how can we help you? You know, and then there's the players like, yes, you know, there's that build up of uh, that kind of thing. So I always like to make generally the first encounters with things rude, you know, and out of the way, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they should there should be some of those knights of Sumter around. You, you know, you can use them at any point. So starting. OK, the the one thing I, I, I want to start with is the Deserine Valley. You want to kind of know. The area. Now, I took out all, I found this map online somewhere, and I, I didn't want any of the, you know, other adventures. I just take cut out the fat. You can start right with this scary story. It's a very scary story. There's, there, there are, the rope, the cult, low level cults, the first level cults are roaming around, abducting farmers and merchant caravans and all that, and killing the people and taking their, their supplies or riches or whatever, treasures. So that's, that's it. That's all you need. You don't need um, a bunch of other adventures, um, you know, and, and then you can use those other adventures as one offs or whatever. So what's cool is, OK, so Tribor, obviously, you, and where the character started for herself. I suggest Billiard. I'll start with that right now. Billiard. I kind of like Billiard, Billiard. I don't know how to pronounce it because it's supposed to be retired adventurers. And so the, it could be their parents like they could be raised from them or maybe. Uh, apprentice type, you know, things. So that'd be kind of cool, like an old wizard, an old barbarian tanner, an old dwarf smith who may be the one that knows all the runes. And I, I think that'd be the coolest place, Billiard. Um, they, you know, they're close to Summit, they're close to Summit Hall so that the knights kind of know them and stuff. And obviously, there's gonna, I, that'd be a great place for the weapon of uh, the Devastation Orb event to happen or even the prince of elemental evil starts coming that way and you're you know and your npcs are there to help your parents your father or your or your mentor you know that'd be cool that'd be awesome so the player if the player started there it'd be cool uh, first level and of course they're gonna have at first level 
they're obviously going to be, you know, got to go help the halflings over here at the West Bridge or, you know, or or uh, escort along the road or along the river. There's plenty of uh, awesome ideas. Or what if one of the characters is like a paladin or a knight and then, you know, beginning whatever and they could squire and they, they could do a road thing here or whatever. So I think that I think Belly is a good start. Westbridge, you know, if your characters are more elven and halfling, they can start here. And obviously they've got adventure stuff because they're afraid of the uh, vultures and abductions and what's going on. So they're all kind of, um, you know, hunkering down and not wanting to do anything. And um, until that fear, until these people protect the roads. Um, let me see what else. I did have an idea here. Oh. Just so you know, real quickly, when I start off any kind of as my as a DM, just as my typical thing, I always start the characters off. I don't like to start them off as like suddenly everything's attacking or whatever. And there's a big adventure. I like to start them off. Here's your town. You know, the Smith, you know, the Tanner, you know, the Fletcher, you know, or you get or you introduce them at the, pretty quick and they get to go in and they get to see what items they could get and, and the prices. And obviously most of it's out of their range. So they, now they have a goal. Um, uh, so I, I do tend to do that and I just have some, I just typed up stuff that I was going to do for that. I do like to uh, do an oil of sharpness plus one, which is, it just gives them a plus one on their weapon for one combat. And that's from 50 to 150 gold around. So they know they could buy one if they can afford 50 gold. Uh, but then they, you know, they get some gold and can, can, can buy, get some more of these. And I like to do and heal two to eight is another one. And then I make these readily available. Um, and that way. You know, you don't throw the too many magic items at them at them too early, and then they have to keep using these things as opposed to always having to get magical items. And these and and I do like to I do like to sell them plus one non magic stuff like plus one weapons or plus one uh, bracers or whatever that are not magical, just well made and they're but they're expensive, two hundred gold, whatever. So I like to get that going as well. Okay. So that, you know, they eventually get a plus one magical weapon, which is still better than a plus one non-magical weapon. You know, I did think of an idea like a kid of, of an old wizard and, you know, that kind of thing, which you could do. Or I, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. I kind of like them just like just looking around and looking for stuff. OK, so let me just go through this real quick. The uh, uh, OK, I started up here. Tribor. Uh, so this is a good large town and it's in the giant series, the map and all that. So you, you could start there or have, you know, devastation orb there or a reason to go there. Yarter is interesting. It's a large river citadel, many abductions of drunkards, beg beggars for the water cult. Extra info in chapter six, uh, if you want to do a little bit of that. Yeah, the chapter six of Princes of the Apocalypse. Westbridge and Helven Blade House. Okay, that's over here somewhere. You don't doesn't see it on the map, but it's over here. It's on the it shows it on the other the book where it's at. It's um it's obviously near well, the, okay, so Westbridge is here, and Helven Blade is somewhere in here. Um Halfling farmers, a few sad missing, you know, weary of large vultures, can provide halfling provisions, elven too, maybe some minor healing, bonus sustenance for promise of help, finding giant vultures and ending them. So that's a nice little story. And obviously halflings could make, you know, biscuits that give you one die four. Oh, hit points. I, I'm i assuming this is a D&D, &D, but anyway, I've just, just so you know, hit points are not just flesh wounds, right? Hit points are, it's not just when you do medieval combat, it is not just getting hurt. It's it's exhaustion. It's strain. It's joint tears. It's um, pains and aches that keep you from fighting. And it's not just flesh itself getting cut or bashed. It's your pure exhaust. I mean, many fight many in the when you do medieval combat fight, you you get so exhausted you can't even fight. So you you're dead. You know at that point they can just kill you with a killing blow. Um, so that's what, that's what I do think of hit points. So you, thusly, there's more things that can heal someone, you know, in the, in the like one die four hit point range, one die six hit point range, you can get biscuits or honey and, or Gatorade, you know what I mean? The, in the sense of, uh, uh to re resuscitate your energy, um, and your hit points. And, and so that's what they could get some of that as a reward, you know, 10 biscuits, each is one die four, but you can only, it takes five minutes to heal. So you can't do it during combat. So you stuff like that. It's kind of cool to get. Um, and Helven Blade House is kind of cool here. Helven Blade House is a great point to meet secretive bronze dragon Umsherial. I'm going to say he has a bronze medallion. Here's why. He eventually they might know that he knows draconic, so he could decipher a tome ledger that they find in the crypts or whatever. And I, I think I put one down there somewhere. 
but that will have like a ledger of what's going, what, what somebody, one of the villains is doing. And so they know they go to him to get it deciphered. And he has a bronze medallion. And someone else knows and tells them, oh yeah, that guy knows that. Okay. So what's cool is I, I would think later on when it's needed, a bronze dragon shows up in a, a climactic moment, right? And maybe when the Prince of the Apocalypse is roaming the land, they help them. And they see in there, you know, oh, where did this bronze dragon come from? And of course, they see the little bronze medallion maybe embedded in the scales or something. That's the what? Oh my God, that's him. You know what I mean? Like that's that's going to be an awesome reveal or connection. And when you make those kind of connections between NPCs and, and an event or whatever like that, that really makes the characters, you know, you know, start sitting up and, oh, you know what I mean? So um, so that's a cool thing to keep, keep in your pocket, you know? Real fun thing. So, but they had already explained that I thought that was a cool place to to start them. Uh, Red Larch, you know, it's got they got a lot of info in the book on that one, so you can start them there, or they could obviously go visit there, maybe for mid level stuff. Uh, the Veil of the Dancing Water is what's well, on here, but I would just it has a whole adventure, obviously, and that's the one that the guy said was cool. And I would just keep it a simple, cool, beautiful, you know, waterfall rune ruins type place that they could you know come by, especially when they're dealing with the river looking for river things and stuff they could get there could be some cool little thing going on there you can encounter some ghost or or info like they, they encounter a dwarven ghost who gives them info that'd be cool okay summit hall is obviously where the knights are and clerics but I, i'm assuming i'm assuming paladin um they're trying to protect the rose but there's only a few of them have um they'll have some info they would look, kill for hippogriffs but the feather gale are considered enemies so they would kill for some hippogriffs or you know what i mean they, they really would like some but they can't get them so that would be a, a solid point. Amphel, uh down here, close to water deep, rough brick style stone, brick style town. Uh, probably good for a devastation orb later on. Okay. Rundrell Manor, ignore that. That's like a dragon or a vampire or something. Barge White Inn, that one's kind of cool. Um, it's an interesting, massive lodge like village, uh, an opposing dock to Womford, which is used to be called Ironford. Great for great for an orb attack or whatever. Um, a thief or scoundrel or rogue, you know, rogue type adventure along with Womford across the way. So this is a dot shanty town. Great for water pirates to conscript, kidnap and kill. Nobody cares. You know, may, many are into it. Some might be a good place to fight a bunch of evildoers, tavern, dock, ship. So that'd be kind of cool if they want to go do that. So that's about it. That's the area. And then, you know, you know, you want to keep it focused. So what's next? Um, so the backstory bullet points. I see what I'm doing here is I'm creating the bullet points that they're going to want to learn in each different area. Um, and I'll even mix them up too a little, like, you know what I mean? So uh, in, obviously in the villages, they're going to learn the cults have risen, hiding at different outposts, people gone missing or joining cults, increase in bandits, pirates on the river, not safe unless in large groups, farmers disappearing, giant vultures taking them, signs of quakes, fires, floods, death, dust devil seen, cause of death and destruction, you know, minor stuff, or the, the, these um, events. Okay, when they get to the outpost and start doing that, you know, they see the sacrifice of humans. Leaders at temples are in the underground. The dwarven ruins have something to do with it. Uh, leaders have great weapons, indestructible, gathering their followers, worshiping gods of fire or, or, ball or water. The name of the province, possibly. Sacrifice souls, filling the land, diviner, visions, dying by elements. Retaliation, that's the next sort of that cross phase here. Cult war parties increase, killing by elements, devastation orbs used, villages, asylums destroyed by element attack. Survivors recount, you know, you, those, yeah, survivors. Yeah. Increase in elemental disasters. Okay, so at the temples, the amount of souls increasing by air first is highest. Encourage them to start here first, right? Uh, if enough soul sacrifice, prophets will summon their prince. Make orbs of devastation and gateways. That's, that's where they make them as well. Enough treasures to make glistening orbs. These are these are things that you they learn. Okay, they're learning. They have gateways hidden in the deep below the temples. Must use weapons given by the eye of the elemental evil. Who's that? Oh, the eye is channeled at an altar. What altar? Weapons forged by a drow smith resting nearby. Weapons indestructible except by the hammer that forged them. See, so this is some serious info they're going to be getting. If they throw their perfect weapon into the gateway with enough souls haunting the realm, their prince of the apocalypse is surely to come. Can get info on the geo levels, strength of the enemies. Okay, so that's stuff you'll learn at the temples if they, you know, and you want to break those up each session. Prior to each session, you know, we kind of have a few of these ready to go, like, and where you they could get them. So with each sesh, uh, each success weakens Colt's ability to attack and get more souls, so prophets will get desperate to summon their god. Finale should kill Air Prophet first. That's my opinion. Uh, next, because she's also weaker too. 
a little bit. Whatever. Next three, mixed, but could get an info on strength of minions to determine who is next, or based on divination of souls haunting land. Best order is water, earth, and fire. Okay. Kill air prophet in her temple. Chase water prophet through temple to fame. Uh, he fights to protect evil eye with the minions. Be awesome to have ogre mech, which is the earth one, actually summon. They go to that one. Earth prophet. Escape them. They chase to black geode. They get slowed. He summons Ulkermech. Ulkermech unsatisfies, takes Earth Prophet as sacrifice. Same with Imax the fire, unless they top stop either or. Neither get enough souls unless they do. Then Imax, with Prophet, attack on land. Get help of some Knights of Sumter Hall. Um, so that's kind of the breakdown of what I would, you know, hopefully um, happen. I do like to get my own treasures uh, figured out. I, you know. The, D, the DMs, the DMs, the Dungeon Masters book treasures are. I do have them in there, but I generally like to have the characters get stuff that's helpful. You know, I mean, that's directly helpful. So I'm kind of maybe I'm kind of boring that way. I kind of look at the numbers game when I do stuff. So it's up to the characters to get creative with these. Um, but like I, but like the the I, magic items in the Dungeons and Masters guilds are obviously more interesting. And then they and then the players have to think of better ways to use them. But I just, this is what I like to do, and it's done me well, but whatever. Um, I like to create my own, yeah, treasure. So that's that's what I have. Okay, and I do have, like, basic stuff and then some more helpful, really helpful stuff that will help them out. Um, and I and I'm, 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 I should also, I, hopefully I will uh, include other regular magic items, too. Okay, so let's move on. And this is a long, wow. I hope you're still with me. I know it's a long, I'm. Are you guys okay? You want to take a break? All right, whatever. The uh, feather. Let me take some water. Let me drink some water. And I'm sweating too. Whew. It's because I turned my AC off because the AC is really loud. So, okay. Feather Gale Spire. Six. So, ah, okay. So, here, here's another actually important part. How to make. Instead of making this a dungeon grind, like a horrible dungeon. And this is going to be for all the different as you can see i've done quite a bit of stuff here man at 30 minutes i've only gotten this far no where am i oh man jeez okay all right whatever feather six feather gel knights um thorough Mur Mur murasaka the sorcerer six howling initiates and one hurricane leader leader of the of the initiates they do they do the mundane tasks, stable, kitchen, garden. And then in the stables, um, four hippogriffs, four, four hippogriffs, four giant vultures. So what I like to do is I like to know exactly how many things are in this air the whole area and then break down where I want to put them. Now, when you when they get to a temple or an outpost or whatever, I really like to break it down into three encounters. Around three encounters. An initial encounter, a climactic encounter, and then maybe a post encounter or or you know which could they could all mix mix in together but generally in that sense I, more than that is kind of it gets kind of a um, tiresome or a grind or it'll take like how many three or three sessions you know and you've got 10 more places to go you know what i mean so i like to kind of break it down in just like a few climactic uh, bits and three is an average it could be four it could be five you know or um probably not, not less than two but whatever Okay, so what I what I would do is there's um, uh, oh if goes oh this is cool if things go bad right the feather gales are going to flee up to the top and then they're just going to drop off you know and then get down to the stable which is now the bottom and can't be reached unless you can drop off yourself unless you could fall and then feather fall and obviously land here I don't know what, okay and then they get in the hippogriffs and take off so there's there, there's going to be that aspect of it that will happen that might happen. Uh, obviously they're going to start coming in here and attacking. Um, cause I don't know how I'm going to play it out yet. I'm going to let sort of let the players decide if they want to, if they want to role play or if they want to attack and I'll decide from there, you know, obviously the, like the guy, these guys are going to react and, um, I'll play it out. Like, um, I'll kind of have some of the stuff in the book and then some just keep it simple. Um, and I have the main knights are obviously up here in the more luxurious area. And the initiates and the the hurricane are down here in this area, in the work area, in the kitchen and all that. And of course, the hippogriffs and the vultures are here. You know. Um, also, I do have a, I'm going to have a tome or ledger here that they find, 
that gives them oh this, these Tom and Ledger is going to give them clues about the how, Sighing Valley. So it speaks of the sacrifices off the cliff, right? So you learn that they human sacrifice purposely. They use the giant vultures. Uh, souls flown through the air, per, you know, for, for a reason. It also it talks of, and this is like Thurl's, uh, Thurl Mur Murasaka's uh, ledger. Uh, he or she, I don't know. He talks of a weary of knoll raiders in the valley, six knolls and four hyenas over here. Um, thinking of getting griffin eggs from a pair should be ready, raise or sell. See? So the, the characters, are, oh, look at that. Uh, fears the manticores on the south end must destroy. Got one Feathergill Knight and his great sword of speed. Plus one and plus one to initiative. <gasps> Whoa, see, that's a cool item. They're going to want to go after that. The manticore layer there. Uh, recruiting wo 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 woes, all just commoners. That's just a fun little side silliness. Uh, Arisa Kalanith is a beautiful elf moon queen leader. He can use her to gain power for his knights. She's an able wizard and can wield that wind vane staff as a powerful weapon. Some sort of summoning artifact made by a drow smith. See, there's your clues right there. Whoa, who's that? What's that? What? Let's write this down. You know what I mean? I, that might have been too much too with the drow smith. I might take out the... I might leave it in there, whatever. Because um, well, they get this basic foundation of information and then they start to verify it through different areas. So that I might keep, keep it as is. You know what I mean? So they're going to get a lot of information. And then this is, I'm assuming they're going to be second level-ish. Second or third, and here they're gonna, if they go to the Sighing Valley, man, that's, they're going to get a level probably just from doing all this stuff. If they get the Griffin eggs, what are they going to do with those, man? Jeez, I they are going to keep them. I, you know, I have no idea. They're going to keep them, try to raise them, sell them to one of the villages. The knights, they're going to get some. The Manticore layer, obviously, they're going to get a weapon there, and the gnolls. I'm going to have the gnolls harass them, maybe. You know, shooting arrows at them if they try to fly over. I don't even know if they can fly over, but fight them. So that'd be cool. Okay, that's that's quite a bit right there. Okay, River Guard Keep, the water outpost. So there's a total of 14 bandits and four thugs. Uh, there's some other stuff in here too, but that's the main, the, the, the generic dudes. And so I've got down, I've kind of just written down where the basics are. Um, so these are all are probably going to be guarded by the main bandits and thugs. Then at K9, uh, there's a watchtower with Fathom or Reach and three crushing wave reavers. So he's probably going to deal with stuff in the water. Uh, okay, so you got Sholar, Sholar, the boat captain with six bandits. Okay, so the, so in, I'm assuming the players are going to wait until they leave or something. And I'm definitely going to have it be that there's activity going on, you know, with what they're doing. Uh, maybe bring some sacrifices in and the players see that, possibly. Um, and, of course, the, the priestess with her two crushing wave weavers in the chapel. Um then there's the Werebor leader and another Fathomer and then two Crushing Wave Reavers in the hall here. Uh, and then there's a library with some scrolls, okay? That's from the Priestess, I believe. No, Orshnara. I don't know who Orshnara is. Oh, she's, she, okay, sorry, with, with the leader. Um, that's all the treasures is up here, okay. So I'm assuming either they're going to try to come in this way, and then they're going to deal with pretty much most of, well, half the bandits. And then, so this 14, there's six. See, I'm going to put some of them on the boat, some of them over here, maybe a couple here. But I'm going to, if, whatever they attack, I'm going to kind of have the main group of them come. And I'm assuming they're going to be fourth level here. So the main group of them will attack them, whatever. They're going to have a boat. I'm assuming they're going to have a boat thing. The priestess, I think that'll just be a silly little adventure where she's stupid and stays in there and thinks she can persuade them. But that's not going to work. Okay, I doubt it. And then the finale with the dude up here. Uh, secret map. Okay, so the journal ledger. They're going to find a journal ledger from the leader guy in the secret map to the Temple of the Crushing Waves via K-22, which is underneath here. And it goes to here. The Dwarven Cryptic uh, D-22. So it's Dwarven. He writes in Dwarven Cryptic. D really hard difficulty wisdom. So they're going to have to probably go find a dwarf to really get this done. Um, it talks of several dark tide knights, a hag, water trolls, and several large water beasts. So even though they know they can get there right now, they better they better be smart and take this ledger to a dwarf, then find out, and then come and do this. Also mentions their lord, Gar Shatterkeel, and his amazing spear. Drow drown, given to him by a powerful dark drow. See, I didn't say drow smith. I wanted to, is that the drow smith? You know what I mean? I want him to like get a little gray area in there so they have to figure that out. It can open a gate to an evil water lord. There is a drawing with his claw arm. Extra remark, can defeat blind monk wench at monastery using loud noise. What does that mean? See, that's a nice little 
suspenseful thing that they that you can add in there to when they get to the second monster there's obviously the deaf monster uh, monk there and she's obviously blind no blind so she can fight badass but if they do if, if, if they do some kind of loud noise thing um then then i will have her have disadvantage you know so, and this is the their, their clue on that one um and they may may not even remember it but i'll just if they do fight her in the tough and then they finally defeat her i'll say oh by the way that was the you know i'll do like an inside roll or something and let them know about the this little clue that they should have remembered um Orders that every boat they plunder, they must drown the occupants. The river must be alive with drowned souls. See, so there's another clue there of what's going on. So, yeah. So that's it. I, I, it's pretty basic. Okay, Sacred Monastery. I'm getting tired here of all this excitement. Okay, so this one, um, you know, I broke down Sacred Monks 12, the the priests, the earth guards, um, where they all are here. So this is the main area. Oh, this is... Obviously, if they come in or whatever, there's going to be a main fight here with how many ever. I'm going to do that, and then and then and then this that's going to build over to here with um, uh, da, da, da. Ellen. No, not Ellen. Right? Um, we're M9, Black Earth Ritual. So this is the oh, the priest. Sorry, Carbo. And oh yeah, and then one of them is obviously going to get that lever, open up this. The Umber Hulk from down here, the Freaky Umber Hulk, is going to come out too. So this is going to be a pretty pretty you know epic um battle i'm gonna make it so that it's i'm assuming now if they trick me and or you know my thoughts my plan and go through here or figure out another or find this other way to go through i'm fine with that too they can kill the doors first and then have a a funky finale over here the dorgers the dark dorgers that are sort of the servants there's a, there's there's two gargoyles here and two here i'm gonna move them over to here and just have four gargoyles in there and then they fight them there um and then if and then one of them obviously will go in and warn her if they're coming this way so that, that's kind of like their watch on this side and the Durger the watch on this side um what else oh and then the, of course the the blind monk helen ray is in here so i'm gonna have that be one thing um and then the oh the lich i'm gonna play the, let the lich play out kind of similar i'm not sure lich is kind of weird but whatever i i think it's fine um or i could just have lich as book oh yeah as, as okay then down here have I, although I'm going to take out M20, uh, the Lich does not control M20. It's just um, either six zombies, well, probably some mummies. And not the mummy lords, just the big, basic mummies are in the crypts. Um, they got to deal with them. I think that'd be pretty fun. Zombies are pretty low level, so why would the you know, fifth or sixth level? That, that's, that wouldn't be that fun. So, so M19, instead of the delegation story, I'm just going to have um, them free the slaves. And they're just going to do more re reveal clues, this stuff here. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go over that in a sec. And then there's the uh, ogre. Yeah, the ogre and the orogs is here. That's fine. That'd be a cool little fight to have. And that's it. You know, so hopefully they'll have a big epic fight at the beginning. Because wherever they come in, um, they're going to be able to have a chance to warn and gather all their forces. Big epic finale fight. Then have a, hell a cool small little fight with the monk here. And then encounter the lich here. And then come down here and deal with the org ogres, I'm assuming. Then have this undead thing. Because the Umber Hulk should be up here and done. And then the slave info. Okay. Make it pretty quick. Uh, so they're going to learn about the passage that leads down to the earth uh, uh, temple. Jureth and Ellen Ray have keys. They can find those dead bodies if they've already defeated them. Brag. Um, they bra they always brag of the temple of the black earth. Giant burrow sharks and Marlos Unrel, their leader. He has serpents for hair, they say. And with his gaze can turn ye to stone. So Powerful. Don't go unless you are powerful yourselves. He wields Iron Fang. It is indestructible. Only the hammer from the Drow Forge can crack it. So there's that info. But return us to the village for rewards, please. Okay. So, okay. Scarlet Moon Hall. This one is going to be a good, great finale for the outposts. Because the way I would play it, the way I would play it is like the Conan the Barbarian, the movie. Remember when they were gathering all the cults to follow the leader up on the mountain? side in the tower that's how i would do it so and that's right nonak the barbarian avenger half orc is hiding amongst the cult now there's going to be some good natured druids too that would help them as well they're going to be mixed in amongst the cults i would say there's a bunch of cult people just gathered around it's like whoa and they're going to be like non-combative types even when the fighting starts they're going to be oh you know like so i wouldn't i, I would take out the werewolves 
and all that other stuff and just kind of make it a cool like you know everyone's coming here they're going to be saved this the nature is going to be restored the balance you know and you get cult members are, you know and then they're like oh you know and so and then they meet some i, I would like I, it would be cool to have some good druids or a little suspicious of everyone and you know we want to hope this is okay this is good but and of course you know then they might see no either they'll encounter no neck and he's very suspicious and elusive you know or they'll see him i you definitely want to introduce him somehow maybe from a distance or whatever but he he does like he's able to get away from the players if they're if they want to stop him or are suspicious of him and he because he doesn't want to fight them he wants to revenge right the, the the leader killed his family burned them alive um so the big finale is and you know you got the flame guardians 10 you got the priest forward you got the elazar plus you're gonna have oh so the big yeah big finale is going to be um four guardians two flame priests one guardian each roaming around so that will you can get the 10 of them eventually to come and gather, you know, give them a couple rounds where they maybe don't have them all. Yeah. Yeah. Come from the tower, six guardians and two priests and Elazar. So you'll start here fighting. Oh, they're going to, and then one of the priests is obviously going to spend his time summoning the elemental and two hellhounds. Okay. So that'll be big fight here. Um, and the wicker giant, you know, they got to flame that up that there's a lot of dead bodies. They're trying to, they want to burn everyone, the cult members. And maybe you can do a horrific thing where you see cult people coming in and they willingly, you know, ridiculously let themselves burn. Um, and so this guy and these people are going to help. These guys are obviously got a lot of healing, I would say. Healing, 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 help. Fog cloud. Um, gust of wind maybe might help. Hold person. He's gonna, He's got braces of fire. So he's going to come in and do his thing. Okay. Uh, at some point. Um, and then there's... Um, so the real mo- real motive here gather followers perform huge fire ritual burn them and sacrifice elazar cajoles the more soul sacrifice and fire the more powerful the fire god will be the greater chance vanifer unblemished tender strike uh can open the gate with satisfied with a satisfied imex you know how everyone to say that okay so that's going to be cool i think that's going to be a fun one and you know it's going to be kind of like one big battle okay i'm going to stop here man Ooh, 46 minutes i'll do a part two that's going to go into the temples and um, all that. Because So part two coming up. But this is part one. I hope you enjoyed what I've done so far. I hope it's been helpful. It gives you some ideas. Streamlines it a bit. Um, and I do like Prisons of the Apocalypse. It, it just needs to be streamlined so a DM can manage a, a story. And um, that sticks to the theme. But again, what... Wizards of the Coast is doing what the writers and editors and the whole team of people are doing is great. More is better. So what they're doing is, is, is awesome. They're just they're just throwing a bunch of stuff and you and you and me as DMs, we can figure out the way we want that to go. And I'm hoping that this is just helps you manage that these are manageable, you know, and I put a lot of time into it and, and reading it and, and then figuring out what I want to do. And that's really what you should do as a DM. You you take you take control, you master what you want the dungeon to be. Um, and don't feel ashamed or afraid of all of changing anything to, to fit your needs uh, to make it enjoyable for you and for the players. Okay, so I hope this is helpful and not, you know, hope I'm, yeah, just, bleh. all right, thanks for listening. How do I turn this off?